Okay. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Oh, so I did mean to say, Elizabeth is here courtesy of our great friends at SASTOC, which is the conference that's taking place here in Dublin tomorrow. Some of you may be here from SASTOC, give a wave. Yeah. Welcome to Dublin. It's not raining too bad. Um, <laughs> so um, Chris, who's over in the corner there, Chris at SASTOC.com, he has some tickets for the conference tomorrow. If you want to go and talk to Chris about getting access to the conference, uh, do grab him at some stage before the end of the evening. It's an amazing lineup. Sorry, I had to do that. No worries. Thank you for being here. So the other thing that I should have said as well is that all of the Twitter details are up on the screen here, including Elizabeth's handle, which is at dunkhippo33. Why is your Twitter handle and your Skype handle at dunkhippo33? That's weird. You know, I should have thought about that a long time ago. <laughs> But uh, the gist is, I, I really have always liked hippos from when I was a kid. And I also used to play a lot of basketball. That's it. That's it. What about Don Hippo <laughs> 1 to 32? Uh, well, my basketball number was 33. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, there there are not 32 other Don Hippos, or at least I don't think so. It's good to know. Um, so, when I introduced you, I kind of mentioned the fact that you'd obviously been on that entrepreneurial journey that most people don't take, which is to go the whole route with the startup, get acquired, and come back. Um, do, you, do you feel that your entrepreneurial itch has been scratched? And do you think that people's entrepreneurial itches can ever be scratched? Do you ever just, just do it and say, that's it, I'm, I'm happy now, I'm a super investor? <laughs> um, well, first off, I never intended to be an investor. So I actually feel like I got sucked in. Um, so never say never. I, I think right now I'm very happy at 500 startups, but you never know. Okay. <laughs> so I suppose the, the next question then is like, you know, from your perspective of when you were looking at 500 startups as a, a, an early stage entrepreneur and looking at the teams that are coming in now, what, what do you wish you had known as, as that early stage entrepreneur versus what you know now when you're looking at those teams? Oh, wow. <laughs> I wish I knew a lot. Um, so I did not know anything about fundraising, actually, when in coming into 500 startups. And I learned, actually, a, a lot about fundraising just through School of Hard Knocks by hitting the pavement myself. And, I, you know, I think, actually, now I write a blog a lot on tactical aspects of fundraising. There are just a lot of weird nuances. Like, I didn't know how to answer questions like, do you have a lead or are you looking for a lead? Like, I didn't even know what a lead meant, like, things like that. I didn't really know very much about equity or no to the benefits and the pros and cons and you know the, all kind of the details. So I think the short answer is I didn't know anything about fundraising. I didn't know kind of the strategy, when you should, why you should, what investors are looking for, but uh, but now I do. So I suppose just for background, you, you grew up in, in the Bay Area, right? I did, yeah. So I remember when I went out there first, I thought I was going to Disneyland. I wasn't sure if the place actually really existed. <laughs> you know, so. It, is it is it not almost in the water? Like how could you grow up in the Bay Area and not know about equity and term, excuse me, term sheets? Yeah, well, so I think I knew peripherally. Actually, I've been involved in startups from very young, and that's actually how I got into it. Let me digress a little bit. Uh, so the way I got into startups actually was in high school. So I grew up, so dating myself here, I grew up uh, in the Bay Area during the dot-com boom, and I was in high school during that time. And in ninth grade, so the first year of high school, my best friend from high school asked me, oh, do you want to help out my cousin with his startup during winter break? Um, I had no idea what a startup was. This is all very new, but I had nothing else going on. So I said, okay, sure. So we went to her cousin's office and I, I was thinking, oh, this is so cool. Like here, here's, you know, here he is with all his friends and they're building stuff and they can eat all the pizza they want. And that was the dream. So I knew from that moment that that was what I wanted to do when I grew up. <laughs> so it was actually very much a factor of growing up in the area that I ended up in startups in the first place. What I didn't know on that day or that week was that, well, I didn't even think about how you end up making money in this or whatnot. But my best friend's uh, cousin actually became very successful with that company. He went on to sell it to Microsoft for over $200 million, and he's actually the um, CEO of Zappos, Tony Shea. So he ended up doing very well for himself, uh, but that was all very fortuitous and just pure coincidence. Do parents of kids in high school who have an inclination for, say, math and computing, you know, is there any other pathway for, 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 for parents of those kids than, you know, you are going to be an engineer and you're going to be an entrepreneur and you're going to be my pension? <laughs> well, so actually, I mean, my parents, uh, 
we're not particularly supportive of this. Neither of my parents are engineers and definitely not in startups at all. They just happen to live in the Bay Area. Um, so actually, you know, for, from their perspective, if you're going to be good at math and science, you know, maybe you should become like a physician or something. Okay. Um, so I think to this day, I am a big disappointment to my mother because <laughs> I never went to med school or, or did that. And then at some point, actually, in my career, I did work at Google. And so she was kind of thrilled about that because she could tell her friends, you know, the name of a company that everyone kind of recognizes, but was very disappointed the day I left and actually continues to ask if I plan to come back. <laughs> you're here. So if you're, if you're hiring here. <laughs> um, I suppose when you, when you say that you, you went to work at your friend's cousin's startup, it turned out to be Tony Shea, which is kind of amazing. Uh, but at, at that time, you know, were you looking around at other companies who were at a similar stage? Because you said like, you know, success looks like sitting around eating pizza all the time. <laughs> right, that's a low bar. You'll achieve that fairly easily. But you know, did, you, did, did you look around and go, that's a company, that's a founder? that I really admire. They look like they're doing really well. So who was, who was sort of influencing you at that stage? So, uh, yeah, I don't know why actually, I was thinking about startups at that age. You know, so. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't intend to. Um, and so, actually, so to, to be clear, I didn't work for him. We were just there helping out during winter break. And honestly, like, what does a 13 or 14 year old help out with? Well, not very much. Like, we helped him build some chairs and tables. Um, but, and, and with some of their intranet pages, but um, I mean, actually, he has been pretty influential. I would say that, um, you know, they, he has surrounded himself with some very smart people. Another person who doesn't get nearly as much credit as he should is Alfred Lin, who was his, uh, essentially, I don't know what his official title is, COO, but like Alfred was the guy who really, you know, made sure that the ship ran and was, uh, you know, the, the driver behind all the operations, I would say. Okay. But. Um, yeah, but that was very fortuitous to have people in the industry whom I knew when my folks, and actually just in general, a lot of people at that time, you have to remember this is during the early days of the dot-com boom, there were not many people doing startups at all, or at least not many people I knew, like my parents certainly weren't, and their peers weren't, and my, my friends weren't. It was sort of people in the in-between generations, people who are older than I am, but younger than my parents. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. So after that, that episode working in a startup building chairs, uh, you, you obviously went to college and, and, and studied engineering. Did you, did you plan at that stage to come back and build something and do some product ideas or did you just want to go in and work in, in Google, say, as an engineer? Uh, Google was just starting to exist then, but um, yeah, so I, so I knew from that moment on that I wanted to do startups when I grew up and actually my best friend Jennifer, so Tony's cousin, and I made a pact that we would start a company together someday. And actually, Jennifer was my co-founder at LaunchBit, the company we eventually started later. But um, we weren't able to, you know, their life happened. We went to college. She went to grad school. So we didn't come together to start that business for a long time, like almost 10 years. So when you say you, you, you knew you all, you, you knew you wanted to do a startup and you always had that focus, what was it about doing a startup that motivated you? And what was, what was that ambition? Was it to, to be a billionaire? To it wasn't money. It was it was really about people, actually. So I think it is really important for startups to have some sort of motivation other than money. Like, what is it that will get you through the dark times? For some people, it's passionate about an idea, or they know a lot about a space, and they really want to solve this problem, or whatever it is. For me, it was I really want to work with my best friend and you know all these other awesome people, etc. And and that is the team that we ended up building, actually. So talk us through that then. How did you how did you end up deciding on on building something eventually with Jennifer? How did that how did that come about? So a lot of years passed. Uh, I think in general we put put this on hold, um, and really it just came down to sort of timing. Like she had finished grad school, decided she definitely didn't want to do academia, and uh, you know that seemed like good timing. And for me, I had left Google already and was already starting to dabble in side projects. So that it was pretty much that. Okay. And, and similar to Tony, because I know the sort of like the, the urban legend about Tony is he's kind of said, I want to create the, you know, the internet's greatest customer service um, company, you know, just to make people feel wonderful about the commerce experience, and then decided it was going to be shoes, right? And I don't know how true that is, but it's a good story. <laughs> you know, did, did you kind of do something similar? It's like, I want to work with amazing people and build products that people love, ad tech, or, you know, well, how, how did you approach that? 
Yeah, so I'll answer that question in a second, but I, uh, going back to the point of, I think you have to have something motivating you beyond money. I think that's really important. And so for Tony, you know, a shoe company, it, it's really hard for a lot of people to get really excited about shoes. I mean, granted, some people are, but not everybody at your company of thousands of people will be excited about shoes. So for him, that, that thing that got his employees going to work every day was like, oh my gosh, we really want to, you know, be helpful to our customers. And that was the kind of culture he created. So similarly for us, like we were an ad tech business. I don't think anybody is passionate about like, oh my gosh, I really want to sell more ads. Like nobody really says that. <laughs> I don't know anybody who's passionate about ads. So um, you have to find that thing. And so for us, it was like about people. Um, our angle was much more around, you know, we're helping uh, our customers who are marketers, like, you know, s in increase their revenue, et cetera. So, those, those are the things, especially around people, but secondarily around helping marketers, like those are the things that we made as pretty core to our business. Okay. So maybe step back a little bit then into the, into the, because you were very familiar with the ad tech space because of your time in Google. What was, what, what was, the, what, what was the learning from your time at Google that was, you were able to bring into to launch but then when you started? Actually, I was not, because I didn't work on the ad side of the business, but I was a marketer. I, I started out in marketing early in my career, so actually the way we started LaunchBit was not as an ad network initially, but we were going after the problem of trying to help marketers um, essentially you know, increase their revenues and whatnot, and that actually ended up being an ad network. And actually, this is a, lot, this is a pretty common story of how a lot of ad networks get started. Um, but uh, so so I think most of my learnings around ads happened while I was working on LaunchBit. Okay, so step back even even further. Then how did you end up working in a marketing role in Google after studying engineering in in, in college? So it, that's, uh... Yeah, so it all got started sort of. So back in college, so I studied engineering, and uh, my senior year. This is a little bit of a digression, but relevant. Like. My senior year of college, I thought I wanted to go to business school, and I wanted to check out a couple of business schools in Boston, but I, I didn't have the money to pay for my ticket from uh, essentially San Francisco to Boston. Uh, but meanwhile, I read about this, this job fair that was happening at, in Boston, and they were offering free plane tickets from, San Francisco, for, from anywhere, actually, to Boston if, uh, if you won. And so I applied, and I won. And so I flew to Boston for free, and I got to check out the couple of schools that I was interested in. Uh, and in exchange for the free ticket, I had to attend this job there. And as we turn out, actually, that weekend, I got a job on the spot. <laughs> uh, fastest job interviewing process ever. But this job fair, actually, interestingly enough, was for jobs in Japan. I don't really understand why the largest job fair for jobs in Japan is held in Boston every year, but it is. And um, so anyway, I got this job and it was going to be in Tokyo. I still had my heart set on going to business school, but as it would turn out, I didn't get into any business school. So I had this job offer and I took it. So the next year I flew to Tokyo, packed my bags, moved there. And actually my Japanese, although I had studied it in school, was not good enough um, for their needs. And so, they said to me, you know what, you, you can't stay here. And I was like, oh my gosh, am I getting fired? Like, this is terrible. And, and they said, but you can, you can move to marketing because, where I wouldn't have to interact with any customers or partners or anybody, just like, you know, be, be in the back. So kind of build like technical demos for them. What was the role that you've been recruited for in Japan? So the, for this company, uh, National Instruments, they're actually headquartered in the US, but they have a sales branch in Tokyo, and so engineering at a sales branch turns out to be a lot of like, um, essentially debugging customer problems. Like, I'm having issues with the, your software, I can't get my program to work, et cetera, and so kind of help them with their problems. Um, so it's pretty customer facing if you're in engineering there. And uh, they didn't think, they didn't feel comfortable putting me on the front lines. <laughs> so when you, when, when you took the role, what, what did you expect that you were going to get out of, of it? You know, professionally, like from a career, like obviously moving to Japan is pretty amazing, right? That's an amazing life experience and you get lots of personal stuff, but professionally, what were you hoping to get? Uh, it, I hadn't thought that far. It just seemed like an interesting opportunity and I had one job offer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And no bus ticket home, right? Get out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so so you moved into a more marketing facing role. How did that? How did you find that? Was it was it more challenging than you expected? Uh, no, well, so it actually turned out to be a great fit um, because I learned. So it was a B two B company. That's where I started learning about you know lead generation. Like we would hold these webinars and whatnot to essentially you know collect leads of top executives at these different uh, potential customers, companies, and stuff like that. And so it was actually a, a much better fit for me in general, but it was sort of from that point on, that's how I ended up getting tracked into marketing in the first place. Okay. So I'm going to jump forward again, and I'm kind of jumping all over the place, but just bear with me. So let, let's go back into launch bit. You, you've started there with Jennifer. You, you, you're, you're starting to get that understanding about the ad network. Did, did, you, did you map out, this is what our fundraising um, pathway is going to look like and you know, 500 startups is, is there and we're aiming for that. What, what, was your, what was your plan around that? There was really no plan. <laughs> and this is where I wish I had known more information. I didn't really understand, I guess, in the beginning I didn't understand why you fundraise or what specifically investors are looking for. Uh, the answer is growth. Like investors are looking to understand if you put, say, a dollar or a euro into this business, like on what time scale are you going to get that out plus more, et cetera. I didn't understand any of that. Um, so I didn't really have like a fundraising plan. I think a lot of people also just generically say, oh, I'm going to raise a million dollars or whatever um, because it's a nice sounding number. But and, and we kind of were in the same boat. I didn't really understand, like, uh, how do you pick your number? What milestones should you be aiming for with this number? Etc. So it was a little bit more arbitrary than I would like to admit. So you, you didn't have a fundraising plan. You didn't understand your market. You had no experience in ad network development. Why, why do you think that Dave and the team invested in you? <coughs> because we could hustle. So uh, prior to LaunchBit, so when we entered 500 startups, we were actually more or less at the idea stage. Um, 500 Startups is very different today. We would not have been accepted for sure. Like these days, the companies we're accepting are a bit later stage, like post seed is what I would categorize ourselves as. Um, but back then, they were very early stage. But what I did was, I prior to that, I had a bunch of side projects where I would just, you know, sell a bunch of stuff. That's probably the best phrase. Like sell a bunch of stuff. Like you know, hey, we made twenty thousand that month, or ten thousand that month, or whatever. Maybe not necessarily a big business, but that we could prove that we could sell and we're not afraid of selling. And I think they like that. Okay. Do you, do you want to just maybe quickly describe, I, I, I'm assuming everyone knows what 500 startups and accelerator is, but do you want to just describe what it was at the time for you when, 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 when you joined? Just, just describe what an accelerator is just in case. Yeah, so 500 startups is an accelerator. It's a four month program and uh, you know we accept companies on a schedule or a cycle. Uh, these days we're accepting about 40 companies back then we per batch back then i think there were about 20 or 25 in my batch and um well back then the curriculum was much more focused on helping companies get to product market fit these days uh, a lot of companies can get to product market fit either through other programs or on their own and so we have ended up moving downstream to help companies uh, actually scale their marketing so it's much more marketing oriented like, okay, this is how you're ad hoc getting customers, but how do you build a process around it? Okay. What, what was the experience like for you? Because I know, like, you know, teams come through accelerators and lots of them implode under the pressure of that, that <laughs> product market fit phase. It's really hard. Uh -huh. um, so I guess what was, what was most challenging for you and what was the unexpectedly easy bits of it? Yeah, we were really under the gun because I would say that of all the teams in our cohort, we were probably the most behind. Uh, there were other teams that you know had a little bit more traction or at least a product. For us, we basically had an idea, and so we really felt under the gun. Like with demo day as a looming, you know, forcing function or pressure point, we were afraid that we were not going to be able to show anything. But I'd say that was both a blessing and a curse. Like it was both extremely stressful, but at the same time, it really forced us to cut to what was most important. So if at demo day the most important thing is to show results. In, you know, in a case like this, it could be revenue results, then what are all the steps you need to do? What is the quickest way to get those results? And for, act, for us, actually, uh, that meant that I had to start selling ads without a product because we didn't have a product and we didn't have time to build a product. Um, and so I, I basically, I had no sales background. I basically had to start pre-selling ads to marketers. And that actually turned out to be one of the best things to happen to us, but it was extremely stressful at the time, especially since I had no idea how to sell. And um, 
you know, but you just have to do it. T tell me about the, the team at that stage, so because you know you're talking about a lot of the skills you don't have that you need to actually go <laughs> go ahead and build something. So like when you were pre-setting ads, was Jennifer just there stressing? Or? <laughs> yeah. Well, so there were, there was just the two of us full time, and then we also roped in another friend of ours from high school to help us a bit. Um, so, but it was primarily the two of us, and it basically meant that I was selling, and she was trying to essentially play product slash support on those sales. So let me explain. So for example, I started selling these ads. We initially started placing these ads manually, and then customers wanted to know, okay, well, how'd these ads do? So we didn't have any, we didn't write any code or anything in the first couple of weeks, and so Jennifer had to immediately write like a very basic analytics tool basically to track impressions and clicks very very simple like you're talking like bitly for the clicks and you know pixel tracking and and then we and then so she would write these scripts to basically keep up with what customers were asking for so she was building product in parallel to my selling and that was a way that um, one we could speed up to get to results and two actually what I'm probably most proud of about LaunchBit, because I've also had like a lot of failed side projects, but what we did not do wrong with LaunchBit was we never built anything that people didn't want because we manually tested. Okay, so that's that's the concierge service, right? Yeah, that, that, that Eric would talk about. Yeah, very much. Yeah, I mean, did, did, is that something that that was uh, that was presented to you as part of of, of of the cohort experience, as part of the program, or is that something that was just intuitive? Oh, it's not intuitive. Uh, a lot of my failed side projects were because we ended up building on a whole bunch of things nobody wanted. So how, how, how did you personally then take on that somebody said, stop writing product and just focus on selling this stuff and concierge? Like, did you resist? Uh, you you're out of your mind? Well, I had too many failed side projects <laughs> prior to that from building too much of what nobody wanted. So I, it, was, uh, it was something that I had come around to. Do you want to share one of those? Some, oh, some of the failures? Yeah, sure, like... Sure spectacular. Uh, well, I don't know if it was so spectacular, but um, for example, one of my failed side projects that I was working on, actually while I was still working at Google, was um, a company called Parrot View. It was essentially a real-time co-shopping tool um, where people can buy stuff together. Now, maybe there are ways to make this product sing, but we definitely had not built the right things. And we just kept building and building and building. This is actually not with Jennifer, with a different friend. Like we just kept building and building and building for probably a good year. And then when we l launched this, like uh, nobody used it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happens a lot of products. Yeah. How did you, how did you? Because I'm 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 always curious about entrepreneurs who go into this this that 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 cycle of product market fit testing and understanding when to give up. So when you did Parrot View, how did you know that it sucked? When, when did you realize this is just dreadful? Well, so the other problem is morale. And that's what I realized with Parrot View. So morale goes up when people see progress. And building more product is not progress. Like getting more revenue or customers or even to a certain extent fundraising or whatever. That's all progress. And the team gets excited about that. But just building and building and building to nowhere doesn't excite people. So what ended up happening here was um, everyone just sort of lost interest. <laughs> in fact, actually, by the time we launched the product, everyone had already lost interest, so there wasn't even any iterating. <laughs> so one of the things that, like, the reason that we're called the start of grind is because we celebrate that grind of being an entrepreneur, right? It's, it's the not fun testing of, of your assumptions and going out and hearing that terrible feedback and going, what the hell are we going to do now? Um, yep. Yeah, for sure. You need that, and you need that feedback quickly. Um, there was an article, a blog post recently by one of the founders of um, Urchin, which is actually Google Analytics. Urchin was acquired by Google. Uh, I don't remember the, the name, but you should Google for this. Essentially what he says in there is velocity is really important. So what he recommends actually is just like close those sales. It almost doesn't even matter what it is, just like keep closing and quickly because that's what keeps people motivated. And so that's what we tried to do. Um, differently the second time around. Do you, do you find that a lot of people who come to you or would have come to, to, uh, to 500 previously were drawn to that allure and then scared away by the, that grind though of actually having to do some work rather than just building a product because product is fun? Yeah, building product is fun. And I would say actually that is probably something that, I mean, 
there were definitely hustlers in the old, older cohorts, like definitely a lot of hustlers in those batches. Um, and it was like I said, that was actually something that got us in. But that being said, I think there was also more thinking back then. This was before Lean Startup became really mainstream of let's just build longer versus now, like the company's coming in, like they're on fast cycles, like, you know, like, okay, let's implement today, whatever's the shortcut to get to these results that we're looking for, let's do it. Let's do it today. Let's do it next week. It's, it's on the order of days and weeks rather than weeks and months or years. So I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time and I'm moving you along at a, a breakneck pace here, but you managed to sell your company, right? So you obviously survived long enough and had morale, survived long <laughs> enough that you, you, you got through 500. Talk about the, uh, the acquisition. And, yeah, and, and, and so we sold uh, LaunchFit to a company called Buy Sell Ads. They're an ad tech company uh, based in the US on the East Coast. And um, we know those folks for a pretty long time. Actually, we had been partnered with them. It was like a revenue partnership uh, for probably a good year or so prior to the acquisition. And um, it was actually through that partnership that we got to know them better. They got to know us. They knew how much money they could make through us. They knew our product like ins and outs and they knew everybody on our team, et cetera. So that's actually, it was, it was actually a very natural conversation because we were already working together so closely. Were you surprised? Uh, even though it was a natural progression of the, of the relationship, did, were you surprised when they started talking about acquisition? Um, well, it was very casual in the beginning, and in the beginning I was like, oh, well, okay, well, not really interested. And so actually we didn't even talk details when they first brought it up. Okay. Um, it, that only happened later. And so if you had to ask me, like, oh, when did you start acquisition talks to when you ended? Like, I, I don't know if there was really a starting point with a situation like this. Okay. Did it, was it something that you had in your head, though, when you started it out? Did you, did, like, did, did, did you have a number? Did you have, uh, you know, uh, I hate the word exit strategy, the phrase <laughs> exit strategy, but did you, did you go, I want to be bought by this kind of a company for this kind of amount? Uh, no. So this is, I guess, pretty consistent with my whole life. I don't, I don't really have <laughs> plans, and also kind of why I gave you a wishy-washy answer about what I'll do next, because I, I just have no idea. So I, no, I didn't have a number. I wasn't looking for an exit. It, it was just more that everything ended up aligning. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a great answer for you on that. I probably should have thought about that more. No, I'm, I'm curious though, because you had a team at that stage, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what, how, how did you communicate that to the team? Is this this is amazing opportunity, or it's I'm out of here with a massive yeah. check. <laughs> you know, how, what was that? What was that like for, for 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 the whole team, not just the founder? Yeah. Well, so admittedly, I mean, most exits come about because people see the writing on the wall. Either people get burnt out, or they see that you know this you're they're not going to take this company all the way, or maybe the two are related. And so for us, like in an ad tech business, and something I've thought a lot about since then, like an ad tech business you end up either getting eaten or you eat others. And it was pretty clear to me that actually when we were running this, while things were going well, like I wasn't really sure how long things were gonna go well because y you end up, well, this is, a, this is a much longer story about ad networks, but you end up saturating out on inventory or whatnot. And um, you know, all the big players have a lot of inventory, like Google, like this is why Google does a lot of acquisitions in this, or they, you know, end up like just beating and stomping stopping the you know, living daylights out of a lot of other companies. So that, <laughs> well, no, no, it, it's a good thing. And, and uh, I mean, that is, like, that is how you, that, that's how you build an ad network. Um, I, don't, I don't mean that in a bad way. This is how you build an ad network. And, um, and so we saw that the likelihood of us doing that to other people was very small. Um, but the likelihood of that happening to us was, was pretty large. So then it was just a question of, Okay, what what are the right terms? What's the alignment? Who and that kind of thing. I'm just afraid of what you're going to say about legal firms and, and software and uh, recruitment companies as well. It's like alienate all of my sponsors. Yeah. Um, so 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 uh, after the acquisition, did you was it like just brush the hands and gone and, and and that's it? Did you try and stay on and and because I'm always curious about like people who are close to the product. I mean, like you, you, you went through the confusion of 500 startups in that process, right? And we'll talk about the confusion more in a sec, but you know, you, 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 you lived and breathed launch bit for a period of time. How, how do you step away from that? Yeah, um, I didn't think it would affect me as much, but the day I handed over the keys essentially was, was kind of a sad moment. <laughs> really? Yeah, I didn't think it would affect me. 
Did you regret something? No, I didn't regret it, but uh, I mean, I still think it was the right decision. But you know, it's like letting go of your your baby, essentially. Yeah. Do you check back in? See how they're doing? <laughs> well, uh, I definitely hear a lot about them because actually, um, Bicel Ads has gone on to seemingly grow it quite a bit, and so a lot of our companies actually use Launchbit and. Um, I know some other publishers that I'm kind of involved with as an advisor who are also on Launchbit. Okay, so they're still, still watching that space. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, into 500 then. What you know, once once because it sounds like you, you didn't have a plan, but you achieved something pretty pretty meaningful, and then you went back to 500. Why did you go back? Yeah. Well, I didn't intend to go back. So again, like not very good <laughs> at strategizing my life. Um, I didn't intend to go back in the sense in the long haul. I did I did mean to go back to, you know, try to figure out what I wanted to do next. Like 500 startups, um, kind of has its hands in a lot of different things, and so I wanted to kind of understand what was going on just in general because like I had been so heads down in Launchbit, I I didn't know anything about like you know other industries. If I wanted to do a startup, kind of where the opportunities were, like whether there were portfolio companies that would be interesting. So I started mentoring. And then one thing sort of left, led to the next, like uh, maybe some of you have met some of the 500 starters folks, but they're pretty fun people just to hang out with and also work with, and so um, that's how I ended up joining. Okay. What was that mentoring experience like for someone who doesn't know how to strategize and plan? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I had learned, that, or I had seen how much I had learned over the years. Like I, you know, like I said, a lot of the companies coming into our accelerator these days, they're a lot later stage now. So, you know, originally I wasn't even sure whether I would be useful, but actually it was very interesting that a lot of the problems that these people were facing were problems that I had faced, especially for the B2B companies. Um, you know, everything from selling to fundraising, uh, just common problems that I could help with. And that was actually just pretty exhilarating because you don't really see the progress that you make as a startup. You're always focused on like, Oh gosh, that didn't go well. Like, you don't really look back and see how far you've come, and that was something that was kind of neat. Yeah, I mean, I guess always, it's always useful to be able to tap somebody who has been recently enough through that experience and, and, and try and understand from their perspective what, what, what they should be thinking about now. Mm -hmm. right? um, but I mean, like, you've, you've, you've become quite influential, a thought leader in the sort of the B2B SaaS space. This is why you're here to speak at the conference tomorrow. Um, when did you start capturing and maybe, I don't know, formalizing a model around that mentorship that you were giving giving to the to, to the teams of the cohorts and um, start writing about it because you, you seem to blog prolifically I don't know when you get the time to do that but <laughs> when, when, when did you start kind of going you know what I've got I've got a formula here that I can as you say to start to apply in, 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 in the context uh, and well so I primarily blog about fundraising so actually, I'm not entirely sure why SaaS stock invited me, but thank you. <laughs> um, uh, no, so I think as far as like B2B, like, you know, I, because I ran a B2B company and also all of our customers were B2B marketers, like I had learned a lot from that. But I blog about fundraising and the reason that I started blogging was actually I realized that I was totally clueless when I went out to raise. <laughs> And, uh, and then I also realized from mentoring uh, our companies, like, although many of them were more savvy than I was, like, there are just a lot of questions if you've never done it before. It's like, what does that mean? Or what does that mean? Or what does he mean by that? Or what does she say like this? Or, in, and so that's, that's actually where I, get, I draw my inspiration from questions that I get during the week. Um, I actually hate writing and hate blogging, um, but I had started doing a little bit last year, I think, and then around the turn of the new year, I kind of made it my New Year's resolution. And essentially every roughly Sunday when my husband takes our, our kid out, like I know, okay, I have like probably 40 minutes or an hour, so I'm just gonna write as fast as I can. And that is my window. And that time pressure actually helps out a lot. So there are a lot of typos in my blog post because I, I don't have time to proofread them. So, so that, that, that's the entire drafting and, and editing process is just that's 40 it. minutes and just get it out as fast as possible. Yeah, that, that is wow. it. And uh, yeah, and I've only, I've missed two weekends. Uh, this past weekend was one of them. And yeah, that, that's it since, since January. So who, who, who do you look at then in the, that, that space, right? Because there, there are so many amazing writers talking about fundraising, right? There's Mark, who I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. on. There's this, actually, uh, a great example is, is um, your portfolio company, the Intercom guys, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're incredible. Um, who else do you look at, at and, and say, gosh, I wish I, I, wish I was, was better at blogging? I wish I was like that person. 
Yeah, there. so there are a lot of great fundraising blogs out there. Um, certainly, Mark's sister, Fred Wilson, um, whenever Dave finds the time to write, actually I think his posts are very inspirational, but he only writes every like six months or something. Um, and so those are the ones that I look up to. I think previously the Angelist folks, like Nivea Naval, used to write a lot more, and that was actually extremely useful. Um, for me, I think my angle is much more on tactical. Like a lot of those folks write about strategy or uh, you know what they're seeing trends-wise or, or or something, and I think that that is great. Um, for me, I my blog I think is differentiated in that it's like very tactical, like. You know, this is what investors are looking for, these milestones, A, B, C, this is what they mean by X, Y, Z, et cetera. So it's um, less interesting from a philosophical perspective, but I think something that can be applied right away. So when, when the new cohorts come into 500 startups, do you just say, read the blog, read the blog? I'm not answering that question. You clearly didn't read the blog. <laughs> is, it, is it their onboarding process? Well, so, so I'd say, like, selfishly, part of the reason why I also write a blog is um, I get a lot of emails with questions, and the questions actually tend to be all very similar. So sometimes I will just, like, copy and paste the URL to a post I know I've written and say, yeah, actually, blah, <laughs> and here it is. Um, and so, yeah, it is helpful for scaling up answers for more people. Okay. So um, let's talk a little bit about the role, then, in, 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 in 500, the, the partner running the accelerator. Um, you must get inundated with people asking you for time, for advice, for money. How, how do you how do you go about finding people to bring into the, the cohort? And I know some of them are probably you're you're probably hunting in slightly later stage than some of the folks here. Are. But how do you how do you go about that? Yeah. So actually, um, I didn't realize this, but I actually see it before. But I actually see um, uh, investing as a little bit like running a B two B sales process in some sense. Um, because unfortunately, as much as I would love to chat with everybody for 10 minutes on the phone, I just can't. But I do want to be helpful. And so if like somebody is not at the right stage, let's say you just come up with an idea, so they wouldn't be a fit today for 500 startups. I think it is still worthwhile to build that relationship. And so what I, what I try to do is through a combination of like, like I actually try to move most conversations these days to email. Uh, and that actually I got inspiration from some of my investors on. Um, at first I thought, oh, this seems really impersonal. But from a practical standpoint, actually, I've gotten a lot of the best advice over email from other people, like from some of my investors. And actually some of my investors even offered to invest over email not having talked with me, which is interesting. I actually think you can do a lot with that because then it's like every you know couple of spare minutes I have, I can then write a response to somebody rather than trying to block off particular times. Uh, it's, it's, I can help more people and also I can be responsive to almost everybody. Okay. And then in terms of when, when someone, so, so flip that around, I'm a startup who wants to pitch to you. What should I put in my email? <laughs> well, the easiest way, so if you're pitching, well, so there are a few things. Like I, I guess people, you know, some people have questions like, about B2B sales or fundraising or whatnot, feel free to send questions and you know I'll respond over email. That's no problem. If you're pitching, the easiest way for me to kind of parse that is like, you know, essentially bullets, like very, almost very direct American style communication, but like one line about your company, this is where we are, we achieved A, B, and C. Um, you know, what is the best way to talk more about this or something like that. So kind of like what you would do in a cold email, like sell kind of the key things, but make it very short and concise. Uh, I, I do respond to every email, but the longer ones are people just ramble on and on. It's like, it takes me longer because I need to read paragraphs. And so those emails tend to not get responses as quickly. So when, when we were chatting just, just briefly beforehand, <coughs> excuse me, um, you talked about the, the process within 500, which is you know you tend to get a, a champion within the team. So you, you find a startup because of your sourcing activity, you think this is a good one, I'm gonna be the champion and I'm gonna bring them into the cohort. Um, what, I, I, what, what, do you, what, what patterns are you trying to match there when, you're, when, you, when you decide I'm gonna be the champion? Is it like, this person also has no strategy just like me, they're, they're <laughs> gonna be a success, uh, they wrote an amazing email, what, what, how, how, do you, how do you decide this is it, I'm gonna back these guys? Yeah, so this is what I didn't realize before. So when you pitch a VC firm, whether it's 500 or any other VC firm, 
um, you're, you're not really pitching that VC firm, you're pitching that individual. And actually individuals have totally differing opinions. Like within 500, I could say like, I, you know, I really want to back this company and my colleague could be like, oh, this seems like terrible business. Could have completely opposite opinions. And actually it's um, probably the best investments that have the most contention. So in some sense, it's a little bit luck of the draw who you end up talking to. That's why actually it is a pretty important <coughs> exercise to make sure that you're talking to somebody who, as best as you can, like do your research and see if this person's a good fit. Like for example, if you pitch me like a consumer mobile app, like I'm just not going to get it. That's not my background. I What I'll probably do is if it seems reasonable just from a general bird's eye view, I may pass you on to a colleague of mine who looks at that. But like starting with me as a starting point is probably not your best entry for that. Versus if you're a B2B company, then starting with me is probably a better entry than one of my colleagues who looks at consumer. So that's the first thing. Um, and then secondly, in terms of my own, like what I look for, and this is going to be different criteria for my colleagues, although generally everybody has the same interviewing rubric, what I tend to gravitate towards are, I like founders with hustle, and that's probably because I'm projecting some of myself. And by hustle, I mean like, you know, showing speed of sales velocity or user velocity or something. That's something that I really love and value a lot. Other colleagues may not, like a colleague who's more product oriented may just, you know, love a really awesome product. Um, so we definitely have our biases in that sense. And so that's mine. I also like semblance of product market fit. Um, some of my colleagues will go a little bit earlier, but I prefer more around product market fit. Um, so, yeah. So I suppose what, what you know, what would characterize the world that both of you and I are, are, are playing in sometimes is things go terribly wrong, right? The, the, the strike rate is terrible, you know, generally for early stage tech investing. Um, can you talk about a, a, pro a project that you brought in that you championed that just absolutely went nowhere, was a total failure? Oh yeah, so for the, well lots. <laughs> well, so there are lots of different reasons why companies fail. Um, I, th I think one actually was almost because of my bias like towards founders who hustle. There was actually this one uh, company where you know, founders actually were really good at sales hustle. And I thought, okay, well that, that is almost enough to overcome you know, lack of product knowledge or lack of being able to build a product. And as it turned out, actually, while they were good at getting sales, they just could not build the product. And so that was you know, my own bias like coming back to bite me. So I've sort of refined that thesis a little bit, like, okay, this team as a whole has to be able to, to build a product. Um, that's you know an example. I think the the big area where people go wrong though is around people morale. Um, there are lots of reasons founders can get into disagreements and have founder breakups or founder issues, but that is also something that is unspoken that we try to assess. Like, but it's very hard to assess. I, I, I've heard Dave speak when 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 he, he talks about. Your, your cohort form, formation that that he, he he applies something and it's probably somewhere between science and magic that kind of says you know we've got eight or nine teams or whatever 10 or 15 teams in there and there's going to be sparks between these two or these these two will learn from each other you know how much how much of that really happens when you're doing cohort formation to address some of that it's like incredible hustlers they're going to make everybody else incredibly jealous and work a little bit harder does do, does that come into account um, not really. So these days we have uh, cohorts of 40. So inevitably, like within a cohort of 40, I think you know people end up getting inspiration or a kick in the butt from other some permutation of other teams in the batch. Okay, but you don't you don't deliberately stir. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, talk a little bit maybe about about you know what you're doing on the program at the moment to to I suppose focus on the product side of things, because I know that that's your background, you know, you're from, from an engineering perspective and some of the work you did at Google, because you hear a lot about people saying, oh, this is a great product focused team and they're all, there's a product mindset there. And I don't think anybody really understands that everyone's got their own definition of what a product focused team is. What, what's your take on that? Yeah, um, so even though that is my background, ironically, I kind of gravitate more towards the sales and hustle. Uh, but what a product focused team is, is, well, one, almost always the teams have built a product or built product before somewhere else. It could be at a large company like Google or it could be at another startup. And I think that there is that experience that, that matters. And then two, they're very user oriented, like making sure that their product addresses 
an actual need and just ha is very um, detailed oriented to make sure that that is happening, that people are not getting lost, that, that it's very clear and simple and not confusing. And that, like a, a product focused team has all of those characteristics so that way you know, they are always refining the product in a, in a good way. And that sounds easier, that's actually easier said than done because a lot of people don't pay attention to that level of detail or they don't track like how people are using it or making sure that the right product features are being illuminated. Sometimes there are too many product features and people are getting lost. So I guess there's probably people in the audience who are at, at such an early stage that you know maybe they're, they're still working in corporate or they're still working in industry and they're either thinking about going to the space or they've got an idea and they're looking to recruit a team. So if, if you were to advise on the skills that they should bring in or to build up themselves or to, to, to bring in onto their team around product, what would you be looking for? What would you be encouraging them to do? So if you don't have a product background and you're looking to team up with somebody who does, uh, this can often be very challenging. Um, I think a common question that I get from non-technical founders is like, how can I find a technical founder? That, it doesn't always map onto product. I think product is not necessarily engineering. It, it also encompasses user experience and all of that. But it, it's sort of generally the same problem. And I think in general, because this skill set is in such high demand, not just from your startup and everyone else's startups, but also large companies, they're kind of rare. So what you need to show is, if you don't have a product background, what are you bringing to the table? Because that will help you attract somebody with that background. Um, so I think the question is less about how do you find somebody, but rather how do you recruit them? Because I think you can go to a lot of meetups and find very qualified people, and then you have to make sure that you have good chemistry, perhaps by working on side projects together. But before you even get to that stage, why would they want to work on side projects with you and I think one of the best ways to show that you are a valuable team member is actually to be the hustler or whatnot. Like, even though I have an engineering background, what I was bringing to uh, my business partnership with Jennifer was I was bringing in sales. So maybe it's sales, maybe it's users. If you're so early and you're not even there, maybe it's customer development interviews. But just hitting the pavement and chatting with people, I think, is the complementary skill set. Would you work with Jennifer again? I would. I would. On a side project. On a side project? Um, you mean a side project that? Are you working on one now? Oh, am I working? On, no, I'm not working on a. I'm not working on a venture-backed side project right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, wow. and I'm also not working with Jennifer right now. Um, what I do have is an event series called Rejectionathon that I just started this summer, and it's it's definitely not venture-backable. Tell us about rejection. The <laughs> but it, it's essentially um, a one-day event where. How many of you have heard of rejection therapy, or the site rejection therapy, or have read the blog like a hundred-day rejection challenge? Nobody. So um, there are these sites that are sort of cropping up to try to help people build a thicker skin. And so what I started with this was this event where people form teams and they have to tackle challenges that will help them build a thicker skin. So you come in, you form a team, and you get a list of you know, lots of challenges. Some of these challenges will really put you out of your comfort zone. Like there's the easy, like high five, 10 people at a bar or restaurant, to the hard, which is borrow $50 from somebody you don't know. Or, or perhaps worse, um, ask somebody to, to help you check to make sure your deodorant is working. <laughs> so these are things that will put you out of your comfort zone. Very difficult to do. Um, and th there's a whole range, but you do this with a team, and it really is, I, I just decided to start this because, you know, going back to my background, like, I didn't have background in sales. It took me a long time to get comfortable with sales, and after a few years, I actually got pretty good at it, but, you know, I don't, I don't think you need to do a startup for several years to, to build a thicker skin. So the idea is to try to help founders build a thicker skin by doing these kinds of things uh, just over and over. Do you want to reject someone right now? <laughs> Anybody want to pitch something and get rejected? <laughs> Nobody's that brave. Can I fifty dollars? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I think we'll open up the questions. We're not going to reject questions, so let's uh, let's move to the floor. Uh, I don't have mics, uh, so just stand up and shout. Your question, go on, Klaus, go for it. Um, I know you mentioned that startup, uh, five hundred startup has moved from from the early stage product market fit now to scaling to growth, 
can you, can you share a little bit about you know what are you looking at, what are you doing, and why are you, why are you helping the startups? Yeah, so the question is what we're looking at um, in terms of what types of companies are a good fit for 500 startups and how we help. So, and so these days, we're generally speaking, there are exceptions, but generally speaking, we're looking at companies that have some idea about their unit metrics. So it's not like we're looking for hockey stick growth. That's not it at all. But when we have a conversation with a startup, we want to have a pretty detailed understanding of what is it that you have learned by working on this business for a little bit. And almost by nature, that means that you have been around you know, not since yesterday, but maybe for a few months, or in some cases, a couple of years, where you understand, like I've tried these customer acquisition channels, maybe it's Facebook ads, uh, maybe it's outbound sales, whatever it is, and you can speak to what that process is you're doing today, what, how much does it cost you to get that customer, what does that customer spend with you, at least to date, uh, of what you know, um, what is the retention, what does the churn look like, uh, the specific KPIs depend a lot on the business or the sector, but um, that's what we're looking for, a, a, a more detailed understanding of that. And then in terms of how we help, so our program now has changed a lot. We no longer help with getting you to product market fit. So we, we help with optimizing for scale. So we have hired a team of marketers and sales folks who previously worked at fast growth startups. So like for example, uh, the person who used to run lead gen at Lyft uh, mobile lead gen at Lyft works with us, works with their mobile companies. Um, you know, so, somebody who previously was on the growth team at Kissmetrics, like, works uh, with our B2B SaaS companies, like the SMB B2B SaaS companies. So, and what we do is we pair up these customer acquisition coaches with teams based on relevant skill set and what the teams need. And day one, they basically dive into you know the weeds with the the company, like. Okay, what are all the different channels you've tried? What do those unit economics look like? Let's see your dashboards. Like, you know, uh, like just really understanding what is happening here and then helping the company um, tweak or change the customer acquisition process to really scale up. Um, very often, let's say a B2B SaaS company, they may be doing sales ad hoc. Okay, well, how are you going to do lead gen repeatedly and then pass off those leads to get demos, et cetera? And, and maybe you have to hire people, okay, what are you looking for when you hire people at each of these stages, and how are they specializing, et cetera. So that's what we focus on during the four months. Thanks, guys. Good question. <coughs> Finn? Uh, hi, Elizabeth. Uh, you didn't really speak to your time at MIT Sloan, and I was just wondering, do you think you could still have had the same success with Launch Fit had you not gone to grad school, or were the sort of connections and lessons you learned there really important for that later success? And I don't think you need to go to business school to um, to start a company. Actually, I would say that uh, not to diss other parties, but like I, I would say that um, you know my time at MIT Sloan, while it was fun and great and actually very helpful in getting me a job at Google, it and it also helped teach me about how to manage sort of politics at a big company. I would say that actually the the best sort of school for startups is probably not business school. School of Hard Knocks is probably the best. But even so, there are other now up and coming programs that are not you know, established institutions that I think would be a much more tactical experience. Have you worked with any of the guys at Minerva? I know they were interning. I, I personally have not. I know other 500 folks have, have chatted with them or perhaps worked with them. Extrapolating on the question about politics, uh, was that outside the classroom or within the classroom that you learned those skill sets at MIT? Uh, so at MIT, um, yeah, so like we, we talked, you know, we did exercises around how do you navigate, you know, corporate politics. The corporate politics were not at MIT, it was just in preparation for going to a larger uh, organization. I would say though that to MIT's credit, I took three sales classes there, and that's actually pretty unusual for a business school. And so even though I say that I didn't have a sales background, I, I guess like that's a half lie. I did take these three sales classes, and so um, when I did start selling, I had to pull up these books again and <laughs> try to figure out, okay, what do you say? <laughs> Stuff like that. Um, but yeah. Nice. Thank you. Uh, you selling product you didn't have with, with launch, but, uh, how would you go about that? 
Yeah, so the question was about pre-selling, and it was honestly very difficult. I, I think when I just say it very quickly and casually, it sounds like it was a walk in the park, but it was very difficult. So I was pre-selling ads, and I was selling to marketers. They were typically like directors of, uh, direct marketing directors or above, of a whole range of companies. And it was, I, you know, I just essentially asked to, I cold emailed a lot of people, I got some warm intros. And um, then I just asked to hop on a phone call with all these folks for 20 minutes. I told them the specific problem that we could help them with. And um, I mean, long story short, so LaunchBit started out like as an ad network for email. And I knew that a lot of marketers were getting great results with email ads. And so essentially my pitch was, you know, hey, I'm starting this new ad network for email and we think we can get you some great results. Like we're still fairly early, but if you come in now, actually that's a great opportunity for you because you get to beat the competition. And that was essentially the pitch. And um, you know, a lot of people said no. A lot of people said, oh, well, I'll think about it or and you never hear from them again or, oh, or come back to me when other people are using this. But um, you know, if you just, just sort of by numbers, like if you call down enough people, somebody's gonna say yes. <laughs> Why do you think the ad industry will be in five years? Oh wow, where do I think the ad industry will be in five years? Well, I mean, I think the ad industry is an extremely lucrative business. Um, it's, it's very mercenary, but an extremely lucrative business. I think that, you know, the problem with ads today is if you look at just the engagement of a lot of ads, like that engagement is decreasing. What's interesting is like in the 90s, like banner ads, you know, those flashy things on, on the web, those banner ads would get, you know, clicked like 75% of the time whenever somebody went to a web page. And these days, you know, <coughs> throw in like one, two, three, if you're lucky, three decimal points. And it's it's very different now. So, and, and really when it comes down to it, if you follow the money, marketers, performance marketers are interested in ROI. So they're not, if they pay you a flat fee for say those ads in the 90s, that may have been a great buy then, but now like with three orders of magnitude less engagement, it's not a great buy now. And so those, you know, the amount they're willing to pay is like three orders of magnitude less. And so what the ad industry is searching for is, well, how can we find more engaging ads? And that's why you see things like branded or you know content marketing that's essentially ads content sponsorships because those have extremely high click-through rates on mobile they're still really high click-through rates just because it's a new channel all but that will go down and so really the ad industry is all about chasing engagement so and that's how it will always be i think once people realize oh this is a content sponsorship and they start ignoring it then there'll be something new and that's not just for the next five years that's forever i just might follow on that question i mean do, do you think that as new platforms come on that the ad industry and, and the consumer are going to go through this cycle in faster loops or you know because i'm thinking about vr and ar are, are we going to have the equivalent for the next couple of years of ridiculous engagement rates on you know the vr equivalent of flashing banners whatever that's going to look like and everyone's going to look crazy <laughs> for flashing banners or have, have the have, you know is, has ad tech educated itself enough to go well, we're just not going to start with that we're going to go for something content branded i think uh well for vr and ar i think people are probably more sophisticated now to stay away from flashy banners. That being said, I do think the initial ads on VR and AR will be highly engaging in the beginning. And then, you know, as people realize, oh, these are kind of junky ads, like then it'll be some other format. So I don't know what the initial starting format will be, but I think it will be something different. So you, you obviously raised funding for, for, for your venture and tried your journey. At what stages um, did you raise that funding, and what were the indicators that you know that you needed to raise it, and if, you know how much did you raise it at each stage? Yeah. Uh, so the question was about um, what the what stages we needed to hit essentially to raise funding, and how much, and how you think about all that. So I think to preface. Uh, again, I wasn't strategic about it. And also, I think 2011 was a very different funding environment than today. I wouldn't say today's funding environment is terrible, but 2011 was actually pretty amazing and somewhat fortuitous. So what I would say for today, and that probably only applies to 2016, it's going to change as either the economy changes or you know the number of startups pitching changes. Um, it, at least for, you know, B2B SaaS, marketplaces, and e-commerce, 
generally speaking, there are multiple stages of seed right now. And um, the milestones that you need to hit at each stage, pre-seed, seed, post-seed, and series A, are roughly the same. And I, I can give you the numbers on this, like from a net revenue perspective. So the GMV you need to hit for like a marketplace or e-commerce is gonna be higher than say a SaaS company, but the net revenue you need to hit at each of those stages is essentially like there's pre-seed, which is idea from, there's the idea stage to about 10,000 per month uh, US. And then the next stage seed is about 10,000 to 50,000 per month net revenue. And then the, the stage after that is about 50,000 to roughly 200, 250,000 per month. And then beyond that is series A. So that's what it roughly looks like today in terms of revenue milestones. Of course, there are a lot of caveats if you're in a competitive space, it may be difficult to raise. You know, investors may have already bet on other horses other than you. If uh, your growth is not there, if you're not growing at all, like you may not be able to raise at all. So there are a ton of caveats, but I would say generally speaking, investors kind of segment themselves into these categories. Uh, I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, good. Uh, another follow on from, from, from that, you, you blogged recently and you talked about the funding roadmap and you talked about that initial stage where you just, you know, how, how many investors should you approach? Or you should approach X amount of hundreds. And you mentioned this earlier on, just to, you know, to get that first in, in, in interaction and engagement. There is an X amount of hundreds of VCs across <laughs> Europe, right? Yeah. You know, and, and, and a lot of the content that we consume here is, is Silicon Valley. Yes. Um, how, how, do you, how, how would you advise folks here to, to apply a lens? You know, should we just entirely disregard it? Because it's just, as I said at the very start, it's Disneyland <laughs> and, and we're not. How do you process that? Yeah, so what David is referring to is I wrote a blog post and essentially in that post I said I have a rough rule of thumb, like for every half a million US dollars you want to raise, you need to be approaching about 100 investors over the course of five weeks. So, you know, essentially 20 meetings per, per week, so really packed in and a lot of people and what he's saying is there are not even that many investors here and in, in, in on the continent and, and that's true. So. So here's the thing, I think that I would say just do the best you can. And I, I mean, I think, you know, there are other cities in the US that have this problem as well. Like in Boston, for example, where I lived for several years, there, you could probably count the number of seed investors on two hands, if you're generous, maybe three. And so there are just not that many people to approach. And I, I think it really is a matter of, you know, do the best you can. If it doesn't work out with the 15 or so that you have access to, then you, I, we find that founders in these kinds of markets have to bootstrap longer usually. And it's just sort of the reality of it. I think that being said, if you can get through that bootstrapping phase longer, you do get to hold on to more equity and you get to control your destiny more. And that ends up being a good thing for you, even though it's a hard slog. So th there are pros and cons. Time for maybe one or two more questions. Jen to the back there. Yeah, do you want to stand up and shout? Yeah. Hi, Elizabeth. My name is Gary. I spent most of this year living and studying Chinese in China. I was fortunate enough to go to the Tech Crunch in Shanghai and have from there. And I learned that uh, China is investing in startups a lot, that's one of the areas they're looking to grow the economy. But a lot of the government is giving out subsidies to startups that they're not actually going down the venture route. Um, I know that's going to change the, the kind of landscape for venture capital the day before there in April. So I wanted to get your idea of what you think the future of venture capital is looking at. So uh, I think the question is, how, um, what do I think about the global VC market and how is 500 Startups going to stay competitive? So 500 Startups is an international investor. We actually have a, a pretty sizable Irish portfolio and we have invested on all six continents. I don't think we'll be investing in Antarctica anytime soon, but you never know. And um, you're so biased. <laughs> I know. You know, just don't like the penguins. So. <laughs> um, and, and so, so I think to that end, actually, you know, a lot of our team members are not in the U.S. So we are actively scouting deals outside of the U.S. And to be quite frank with you, like there are almost the flip side is from an investor's perspective, there are a lot of investors in the Silicon Valley. So it is, it is much more competitive for me as an investor to try to, you know, win deals in the Silicon Valley. So actually, you know, for us, it is to our benefit to look elsewhere. In addition, a lot of the growth is also help, uh, is also happening outside of the US. Um, uh, I think, you know, 
the, the U.S. has had sort of, it's, I wouldn't say the heyday is over, but the growth has definitely slowed compared to some other places. So going back to your question then, um, I think, you know, for us, yeah, the, the global investments is an important part of our strategy, but it always has been and we'll continue to do more there. And I, I, I think I could be roughly wrong, I could be wrong, but about a third of our portfolio is international just in general. And we have 1600 portfolio companies. So we do a lot of investments, I think. But secondarily, from a founder's perspective, yes, there are certainly markets that are easier to raise money in. Um, you mentioned China. Like, China is pretty hot these days. And actually, while we have done some deals in China, almost because it is very competitive, in fact, maybe more so than the Silicon Valley these days, um, you know, it, a uh, founder can get their pick of like where they want to raise if you're in China. I'm not suggesting you all move to China, um, but I mean it is true. Like there are there are ebbs and flows in VC in venture capital around what areas are hot. Uh, I think the other thing that you mentioned is around government subsidies. That's another thing to look at for sure. Like if you can get access to non-dilutive capital and you don't have to sacrifice like you know time into building something completely different. And it may be worthwhile, like a couple of our companies actually here in Ireland uh, have gotten government grants, certainly in other places like Canada, they, you know, they give out shred credits like crazy. Um, and that can actually help you a lot because, you know, at the end of the day, you do want to retain a fair bit of equity. Carl. Hey, um, I just wanted to ask in regards to building relationships with overseas VCs and angels, uh, do you think it's a realistic gateway to cold email these VCs, or is there any other opportunity to uh, get a better return? Uh, yeah, so I think um, the, so the question is how do you get access to VCs, essentially, cold email or other ways. So I think if you can, the best way is through a warm referral. That being said, I realize that is pretty limited and probably limited to a, a number of people. It's difficult to get to a scale of pitching 100 people through warm referrals. So these days, the good news is a lot of newer VCs are very open to looking at cold emails. Uh, and, and you think about it from the perspective of a new VC, and I would put 500 startups in this category, we look at cold emails all the time. Why? Because like we're the new kids on the block, like people are not immediately thinking about us to send us deal flow per se. I think now it's a little bit different with 500, but for somebody who is starting a VC like uh, you know, they just started last year, they may not get as much deal flow, and so they will look at everything that comes their way. And so cold emailing can help you a lot um, there. And I would just say be persistent in following up. I think this is actually where founders, you know, kind of um, can differentiate themselves from the rest of the pack. Like, you know, a lot of founders will lob in a cold email, and uh, a VC may not respond. And it doesn't mean that they're not interested. I think previously when I was an entrepreneur, I thought, oh, they're not interested. But um, the reality is like when I look at my inbox, it's just like emails just go to the bottom, just like that. Just, and so uh, they make it around to it eventually, but it, it's just hard to stay on top of your email. So I would just keep sending emails as long as you're polite. Like don't be an asshole and say, you know, hey, why didn't you respond to me or anything like that? That's not a good starting. <laughs> Point, but uh, like just pretend that they never saw the first email. Maybe they didn't, maybe they accidentally deleted it. And then be willing to try other channels, like not just email, like all the VCs are on every you know app these days, like Snapchat or Facebook or whatever, because it's their job to you know learn about these other platforms. So you know, maybe friend them on Facebook and message them. Like there's probably way fewer Facebook messages than emails, or um, you know. For a lot of VCs who are still traditional VCs, like pick up the phone and call them. They all have phone numbers. So that, I would try different channels and just keep being persistent. I'll, I'll just add to what Klaus said earlier on, the, the, the grind network globally. Like we, we, we feature speakers like, like, like Elizabeth uh, you know, constantly. And, and, and having access to the grind in various cities is a great way to make that warm introduction as well. Time for one more question. Jen at the back.
<laughs> yeah, so the question is uh, about our acquisition. Talk a little bit more about the partnership that we had with Buy Sell Ads and why we decided to sell. So the partnership we had with Buy Sell Ads, um, in a nutshell, uh, for us, so we were an ad network and in an ad network you have two sides. You have ad inventory, which is where you place the ads and then you know you have marketers who buy the ads. So that, that's essentially it. And for us, actually, we were getting our marketers great ROI on the ads. Um, our biggest problem was around supply. And so we had actually partnered with Buy Sell Ads around that, like, hey, you know, we'll sell your supply, like using our technology, we'll run your ad inventory through our ad servers, et cetera. And then uh, that was how that got started. And so it was a revenue generating partnership. Um, we cut them a check like every month. And so that's how that got started. And so I think, like I said before, that's how they got to know us as a team. They knew how much money they could make. They knew everything about our product and the technology and just everything. And um, so that was how that got started. And then in terms of why we decided to sell. So I don't think I explicitly said this earlier, but like for us, you know, we were an ad company and ad companies, I think, like I was saying, you know, they either you either eat others or you are eaten. And like I said, because supply was actually our biggest problem, um, that was a big reason why we sold. Like we could see the writing on the wall, like how are you going to get more supply? Like, you know, and actually for ad networks, that is probably the, the number one thing, like being able to round up all the supply in the world is, is actually the name of the game. And, and that's exactly what Google does very well. I'm going to wrap up questions because we're kind of running out of time. Um, we're, we're, we're going to take a break and go for some um, beers and pizza here. Elizabeth is going to stay around for a little while, so you might get a chance to, to grab her and ask a question if you want to do this one-to-one. -one. Uh, I'm just going to just wrap up with a couple of, a couple of questions. You, you, you talked at length about the fact that you have no strategy, generally in life, um, <laughs> but you've achieved massive amounts, so I think that you're very good at you know, being self-deprecating. Um, I, I do, you, do you think that... But I, I see that you've got a very adaptive strategy, right? To go back to what Eric is talking about in the lean startup, you adapt very well and you just sort of like, you're, you're open to opportunity. Um, do you think that a growth mindset like that is something that you pattern match for startups that come in, for founders that come in? And the following question <laughs> about that, I know that's a long lead in, but the following question is, can you educate people about having growth mindset when they're on the, the, the program with you? Yeah, yeah, so to answer your question, I think I do pattern match for learnability or coachability or whatever you want to call it. Um, when I say that I have no strategy, I think it's more like I am not aiming to be a management consultant or I'm not aiming to get acquired or I'm not aiming to be a VC or, or start a new startup. I think uh, for, for me, it's like, I don't know, just, I don't even know how to explain it, but I mean, I think I just look I, I just keep my eyes open for opportunities and be willing to jump into one, um, even if it's a little bit whimsical, <laughs> and and then be able to and then be able to adapt uh, because often these opportunities are not things that you're prepared for at all. Okay, what 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 opportunities are you looking for tomorrow with Sastock? <laughs> well, because I'm not very goal oriented, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think that's a really great way to listen to to finish off. So I'd like to thank Elizabeth, our speaker here this evening. Round of applause.